The song Hallelujah, written by Leonard Cohen, is a hauntingly beautiful ballad about love, life, sex, and faith. It has been covered by more than 300 artists that we know, published or performed and recorded and distributed by over 300 artists. And I heard today that it is the most covered song ever. However, its interpretation is subject to debate. The most obvious and common interpretation is that it is a desperate clinging to love and faith in God amidst the failures and brokenness and disappointments of love and life. The final stanza reads like this. I did my best. It wasn't much. I couldn't feel, so I tried to touch. I told the truth. I didn't come to fool you. And even though it all went wrong, I'll stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. The song highlights a very important truth in life. That joy, true joy, is not circumstantial, but it is spiritual. That it is discovered and even birthed in failure, inadequacy, and heartache. It certainly endures during heartache. It blooms in the most surprising and unexpected of ways, even to those of us who believe the promises. As the song says, it is a cold and it is a broken hallelujah, but it is a hallelujah nonetheless. Bittersweet and hopeful in spite of everything. And this is a wonder. That joy, true joy, is a wonder and an enigma and a grace and a treasure. Paul intimates at the treasure in 2 Corinthians 4, starting in verse 7, where he says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. This treasure, of course, is, is Christ, who cannot be broken or defeated in spite of our circumstances or our weaknesses. And we do have weaknesses because we are trapped in these bodies, right? These jars of clay, that's what it's speaking of. And these jars of clay are weak and fragile and leaky and insufficient. But the treasure in us, Christ in us, is sufficient. And reason for, for hope and, and optimism. And those of us who get it, who get the mystery of Christ in us, who get the mystery of the kingdom, understand what an incredible treasure it is. And the scripture speaks of it in these terms, in these terms of treasure. Again, Paul just, just spoke of this treasure we have in, in jars of clay. And then in Matthew 13, 44, we see Jesus latching on to this image. Where he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. This passage highlights three truths. First of all, my friend Matt, who's reformed, might not agree with this, but the kingdom is voluntary. That it is a choice. The man could have chosen to either buy the field or not buy the field. He found the treasure, he's either going to act or he's not going to act. Second, that the treasure is the source of profound and inexpressible joy. 
And then finally, that the, that the treasure is a sacrifice. That it will cost you everything. And the idea that I want to latch on to from this parable is that the man in the parable sacrificed everything to obtain the treasure. And yet, even in the act of sacrificing everything, it was an overwhelming joy for him. That he felt he got the better of the deal by far. And he would do it again a thousand times. Time's over. In other words, there is joy in the sacrifice. There is joy not just in spite of the sacrifice, but often because of the sacrifice. That there is joy because of what the sacrifice means and what it represents. We see this attitude in the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2, starting in verse 17. He says, But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, so he's being poured out like a drink offering. He's pouring himself out. He says, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. So Paul this joy that Paul speaks of as he himself is being poured out is a tr- is tremendous grace. It is a tremendous wonder. It is a tremendous treasure. Because to Paul, what he's saying is that it's all worth it. Everything that he's been through, all of the sacrifices, everything of what it means to pour himself out is worth it because of the life and love of the kingdom. His heart is content. His heart is full. And it is a glad privilege for him to pass on the life that he himself has received regardless of the cost. The cost is inconsequential. The cost means nothing compared to the wonders of the kingdom. And we find this dynamic and this attitude all throughout the scripture, especially in the New Testament. Like in Acts 5, we read, they called the apostles in and had them flogged. And then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for his name. In Acts 16, 11 chapters later, sometimes later, this is Paul, after they had been severely flogged, Flogging was to beat someone within an inch of his life. And they were severely flogged. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. And there was so much joy in their heart in spite of what they had endured. They were praising God and singing Him. Hebrews 10.34, you sympathize with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So he's praising and complimenting this church that he's writing to because they experienced joy and celebration amidst the confiscation of their property and being persecuted in this way. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering. He says, I know you're going through hard times because of persecution. As though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. People say, I don't get this. I don't understand how this is possible. How is it possible that people can be persecuted and imprisoned and tortured and still have joy in their hearts and still celebrate and sing praises to God? And people ask that question because they don't understand the kingdom. They don't understand the treasure that we have. They don't understand the mystery of Christ in us. They don't understand what the kingdom is all about. 
And it's these same people who ask this question who also sometimes struggle with, say, giving or serving or, or missions. Because they don't get the principles or the ideas or the dynamics of, of the kingdom. Because these things, giving or serving or, or, or missions, are more of a duty or an obligation to them. And so when they do it, it's, it's really like a huge sacrifice. And that's how they see it in, in their own minds and in their own hearts. I'm doing this huge sacrifice for God. But because of their perspective, it's not a sacrifice of joy. It's costly, and it's calculated. And much of what they do may even be done begrudgingly. Oh, here's the church again. Ask him for money. Oh, I mean, he's just harping on it and harping on it. I guess we'd better give. Oh, they're asking for Sunday school teachers again for the children. I guess I better teach because no one else is going to do it. Oh, they're, they're looking for people to go on missions again. I guess I better go because it's expected. And if I don't go, people will question my spirituality. Stop it. Don't do it unless you want to. It doesn't mean anything otherwise. You know, sometimes the ministries of our church suffer a little bit because maybe they're a little understaffed, especially in the children's area. And sometimes our budget just kind of limps along. And at one level, from one perspective, it's really kind of intentional. Not that we want it to be that way. Obviously, I would want it to be the other way. But it is intentional in that I want us to be about the kingdom and not our kingdom. I mean, if you see where I'm going with this, I, I don't want to have to, to twist people's arms and guilt them into serving for the sake of the institution. I don't want people to come to church and think, oh man, they're just, they just want my money. They just want me to serve. It's all about what we can do for them. They don't really care about me. And so if you don't want to give, then don't give. I mean, really. Don't do it. We're under grace. It's okay not to give. If you don't want to serve, don't serve. I will say it with this caveat, though, that if you don't give and you don't serve, then don't complain about the areas where we're lacking and where we don't have some of the stuff that you, want, that, that you want to have. But if you don't want to do it, then don't do it. If you don't want to go on a mission trip, don't go on a mission trip. I'm not going to think any less of you or any more of you if you go or not go. I don't want you to give and to serve because you feel obligated. I don't, want, I don't think God wants you to give because you feel obligated. I want you to do it because it's an opportunity. I want you to give and serve because you want to, because it's an honor and a privilege, because you want to express who you are to God and you want to build His kingdom. I think that's the way that Paul was. And we've read several passages from Paul and his attitude towards things. And some of us are thinking, I have no idea how he can have joy as he's pouring himself out in this way. I have no idea how he can talk about rejoicing with these treasures of, and jars of clay as we're being beaten and, and you know all these things that he describes. And I'm sure that Paul could have been doing a lot of other things than going from town to town, basically getting pummeled. Everywhere he went, he caused this huge ruckus. Then he'd get run out of town or thrown in jail or beaten. And then he's heading out on the road. And in his own writings, he talks about how he was beset upon by animals and bandits and shipwrecked. 
And he was flogged on multiple occasions, and, and he was ultimately in prison and ultimately had his head cut off, dying for Christ. I'm sure he had a lot of other things that he could be doing. But in his own words, it is, it is a joy for Paul. He rejoices because of the privilege of serving God and his kingdom. You see, Paul loved God. He loved people. He loved God's kingdom. And so service and sacrifice were a joy for him because he was serving his God and building his kingdom. And every great Christian and and missionary that I've ever met who's done great things for God and sacrificed greatly for God, I find shares the same attitudes in common with Paul. You know, I've talked to friends who, who have been overseas and where it's cost them greatly and where they've had to sacrifice their families and how they raise their families and all these things. And I talk to them and I say, hey, man, wasn't that a tremendous sacrifice? How did you do that? What, you know, what about this, this price that you paid here? And, and wasn't this costly? And I didn't ask it in those words, but, you know, with more time, you, you talk about those things tactfully and naturally. And every single time, they just kind of look at me and say, it's not a sacrifice. Man, I'd do it again. It was my joy. It was my privilege. And I know in speaking with them that I would have to tie them down to keep them from giving and going again. But they understand that sacrifice is part of the package. They understand that it costs you something to give. But they also understand the secret that many of us miss, that there is joy in the giving. That there is joy in the sacrifice. 